A festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. and. Um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh. Uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. Welcome back to the last session of the day on behalf of all my colleagues at JLF Colorado about the Boulder book, uh, the Boulder Public Library of the City of Boulder. Welcome back. Today's session is The Word and the Voice. Ramon Del Castillo, Natalie Handel, Janice Pariat, and Melissa Rani T. Selva are talking about questions of politics, religion, love, and identity through their words. Poets make powerful storytellers and commentators. Natalie Handel is a poet, playwright, nonfiction, and literary travel writer whose latest work includes Life in a Country album, Poems in the Republic. Melissa Rani T. Selva is a spoken word poet journalist and a poetry educator. She has written Taboo and has published an anthology comprised of 100 poems by 61 poets from Malaysia titled When I Say Spoken, You Say Word. Janice Pariat is a poet and award-winning novelist. Her most recent work is The Nine-Chambered Heart. Raymond Del Castillo is the author of several books of nonfiction, fiction, and poetry, which reveal the realities of being Mexica, American, Indian, Chicano together. They bring the intensity and the passion of the spoken word to this vibrant session of readings and performances. Today, we begin with Natalie Handel, her recent books include the poetry collection, Life in a Country Album, a finalist for the Forward Book Award and the Palestine Book Award, and the Flash Collection, The Republic's winner of the Virginia Faulkner Award for Excellence in Writing and the Arab American Book Award. She's the author of eight plays, editor of two award-winning anthologies, and her work has appeared in Vanity Fair, Guernica Magazine, The Guardian, The New York Times, The Nation, and the Irish Times. Among others, Handel is the recipient of awards from the Penn Foundation, the Lannan Foundation, Centro Andulus uh, de la Letras, and uh, many others. She is professor at Columbia University and writes the literary travel columns, The City and the Writer for Words Without Border magazine and Journeys for Publishers Weekly uh, Arabic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Natalie Handel. Natalie, over to you. Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor 
to be with all of you and to, to perform at this wonderful festival. I'm going to start, uh, of course, we have in the United States, we have uh, the country on our minds. We've, we have this, we've just had this election and we are um, hopeful for what comes next. And I thought I would start the, the, the session with a poem entitled Ways of Rebelling. Who needs to be at peace in the world? It helps to be between wars, to die a few times each day to understand your father's sky. As you take it apart piece by piece and can't feel anything. Can't feel the tree growing under your feet. Eyes poking not only to find another night to compare it to. Whoever heard of turning pain into hummingbirds or red birds? Haven't we grown? What does it mean to be older? Maybe a house without doors can still survive a storm. Maybe I can't find the proper way to rebel or damn it, I can't leave. I want to, but you grow inside of me. And as I watch you, before I know it, I'm too heavy, too full of you to move. Maybe that's what they meant when they said, you shouldn't love a country too much. Now in Europe, um, we have a quite a crisis with all the migrants and refugees and displaced people coming from Asia and Africa uh, into, in, into the European shores. This poem is entitled Europa Nostra. Now that we are guests in our bodies, how do we survive? Zeynep operated a boat to be close to the 103 members of her family who drowned. Basem learned to speak a language with another alphabet. Atek gathered feathers from trembling snow. Beckham carried splintered glass across a hundred mountains. Bina stole prayers from a forgotten body. Saba held the sound of the drums as if it were breaths. Shinolo kept the sun in a folded sheet under a mattress. Roya kept the shadow of the Caspian Sea in the man who needed her. Mikolo dreamed a mystery turned cruel by another dream. Maybe the past is the beginning and return is staying absent. Meanwhile, when anyone says toughen up, look at them until they fade. Holy Cosmos. We've been told space is like two dark lips colliding. Like science fiction, it outlines a small cosmos where fear hides in a glow, where negative space becomes a place for wishing, a constellation of hazy tunes, of faint, sharp vowels, a glossary of meteors, a telescope to God, a cold, bright white. Maybe distance damages us. Maybe Jupiter will suddenly surprise us with a notion of holiness. But instead, an old planet takes over all the space and we are reminded of the traces of fire in our gaze, defining our infidelities. Declaration of Independence. Do you know anyone who loves more than one country? Of course. This isn't an opera. You're right. It's more folk or litany. Are you going to answer my question? I did. Let me ask again. Love isn't a country. Love isn't a lie, but a country is. This next poem uh, is a, a love poem entitled Shur Ahayat, and uh, it's, it's Persian Arabic. Shur is a musical system that means ecstasy, vitality, passion, revolution, and Hayat means life in both languages. Not the city noise, nor the mythic clouds 
will let us know what the night means. Not the waters we confess to, nor our lips in euphoria, or our intertwined bodies will explain where we are and why. Maybe years later we discover we needed evidence of ourselves and each other, or maybe we find all that exists is what we've built inside. Now, when you come to mind, I think, you decided not to love elsewhere, and I to keep traces of you all over my body as if a map of an ideal world. And um, I think I will finish with, uh, of course, we have um, a pandemic and uh, it's, uh, <laughs> we are connecting in different ways and in and, and this poem, uh, speaks to um, coming together. It's entitled Voyage. Shut off the music, the lights. Close the window and travel. Let your body gather voices as if they're flowers in an infinite garden. Thank your spirit for the flight. Thank the earth for the echoes and empathy for emptying your fears of time past. Be certain of your direction. Your heart knows the road, the one with needles under your feet that feels less painful than all the dying around, the one that is made of water, where floating is a long and short breath. And always be kind to the healing earth. Don't be tempted by its roars let the ache out. Gather all yourselves, angel and bark, ancestor and bird. Gather your wanderings so you can rest for a while. Then awake to help those who didn't make it back. Thank you so much. Natalie handled that with absolutely beautiful Beautiful about the healing earth. Thank you so much for sharing your point. I do wish that you were there in flesh and blood with us in uh, JLF Boulder, Colorado, but inshallah, uh, if not this year, sometime soon. Uh, thank you so much. And that's a beautiful thank setting. So and thank you for waking up at uh, beyond the crack of dawn to be part <laughs> thank of Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. The next, our next poet who's coming up is Janice uh, Pariyat. Uh, Janice Pariyat is a poet and award-winning novelist. Her most recent novel, The Nine-Chambered Heart, is being translated into 10 languages. She lives in New Delhi with a cat of many names. Ladies and gentlemen, Janice Pariyat. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. And you might have, uh, you might hear my cat of many names meowing in the background. Um, he likes to join in when I read poetry. So just a small warning. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here. And what an honor to, to read a little bit of my work alongside you all. Uh, Natalie, that was so inspiring. And I was just thinking, what a wonderful way to wake up to poetry. Um, really, we're so blessed. Um, admittedly, I've had a slightly on-off relationship with poetry. Um, um, for many years, I wrote only poetry. And then for years after, I only wrote prose. Um, and it's only recently, the last couple of years, that I've been starting to do a bit of both. And I've found myself drawn to erasure poetry. Um, I'm fascinated by the notion of working with the pre-existing text and creating something new, but that something new constantly haunted and in conversation with the original, um, the original text. So the three poems that I will be reading today are from my experiments with erasure poetry lately. And the text that I've been looking at and using is a travelogue that was written in 1732 um, and written by a young Swedish uh, scientist, a botanist and a taxonomist named Carl Linnaeus. And I'm fascinated with this text for many reasons, which I won't go into right now. Um, but 
just to say that I'm interested in how production of knowledge happens and how different forms of knowledge tussle with each other in our world, specifically Western rational Linnaean knowledge with um, indigenous uh, oral um, knowledge. Um, so the travelogue is called A Tour of Lapland and these poems are inspired by passages uh, within it. The first one is called a villanelle for departure. You depart from the place at noon. It seems the same road as yesterday, though you cannot be sure. It's too soon to tell. The end of May, so close to June, yet summer seems miles and miles away. You depart from the place at noon, no skylarks flight, nor red wings tune to accompany your footsteps on the way. And night, it seems to come too soon with not the comfort of star or moon. Who can tell when you left? Was it today? You depart from the place at noon the ground thick with frost and strewn with tangled roots of trees, a devilish lay. You should have stayed, not left too soon, for you journey now, heart misattuned. What lies ahead? What leads you astray? You depart from the place at noon. You cannot say, is it too late? too soon. The second uh, poem is called Villanelle for Darkness and I feel like they work um, in some ways as little companion uh, pieces. We journey on water through the night. If it might be called so, it is like day. I didn't think I would long for no light. Who knew perpetual radiance, bright as noon, could hurt the eye? Away on water we journey through the night. The sun undipping, unsetting, in sight, above and below us, on the river fully ablaze. I didn't think I would long for no light where the growing shadows, the fading flight of birds, the quiet dawn, we seek to pray, journeying on water through endless night, which is endless day, yet we cannot fight the burden of always seeing. We stay, but I didn't think I'd long for no light, so I may rest, seek the stars, a bright moon to, to, to signal arrival at end of way. We journey on water through the night. I didn't think I would long for no light. Um, the last poem I'll be reading is a sestina. It's called a sestina for the guideless. And the six recurring words are morning, shore, river, behind, guide, and empty. Sestina for the guideless. In a new month, early in the morning, the colonist and you go onto shore. Now you must walk, leaving the river and the small boat behind. You are here to inquire after a guide, a native Laplander, but finding an empty hut, you proceed to the next, also empty, almost a mile distant, seemingly mourning a death unseen. But might you find a guide half a mile further, third hut near the shore? You meet with as little success. Stay behind here. Dispatch your fellow traveler upriver to a fourth, 
while you stare at the river, filled to the brim with blue and empty sky. At your feet, large stones. Behind you, tall fir trees scattered, fresh morning dewed, while you wait alone ashore. But where do you wish to be guided? No one has returned, colonist nor guide, and you must decide by the river whether you'll venture away from shore or wait. How might it be this empty? Not a soul, whether night or morning, the water in front, the forest behind, though do directions front, behind, matter? Unaccompanied, guideless, your path lies fresh and free as morning. You may set the boat adrift from the river and walk away with hands light and empty. But you don't, clinging steadfastly to shore, for always may be taken from the shore. You can hear the red wing calling behind you, are you tempted by paths emptied of past travellers? Will you play guide to yourself? You stand silent by the river, knowing that soon you'll see morning empty itself of light, water drained from shore, morning now for time left long behind. Perhaps, perhaps the only guide is the river. Thank you. Janice, thank you so much. That was just beautiful. And like you said, waking up to poetry. I mean, for us in, in Boulder, Colorado, they will be going to sleep with the resonance of poetry in their years. So thank you so very much for that beautiful, beautiful reading. Uh, we now move on to Melissa Rani T. Salva. We were all together exactly a year a year ago in a beautiful place called Mandra in, in, Aust in Western Australia. But now, of course, we meet on Zoom. Uh, Melissa Rani T. Salva is a Malaysian writer and spoken word poet with notable performances at the Story Fest Singapore and TEDx uh, Gateway. Her first book, Taboo, is a poetic exploration of her master's thesis on the constructs and representations of the Malaysian Indian identity. Her poems have been translated into French and Bahasa Malaysian. She co-founded If Walls Could Talk, Poetry Open Mic, and co-published an anthology of 100 poems by 61 poets from Malaysia titled When I Say Spoken, You Say Word. Currently, she is the co-editor of the literary journal SingporRaimo.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Melissa Rani T. Salva. Hello, Sandra. Hi, everybody. Isn't that the common issue of Zoom? It's nice to be here with all of you. Um, I am very excited to present to you a piece today. So the pandemic has definitely shifted the geographic stages and structures of what it means to be a performance poet. I've spent the last few months trying to figure out Zoom as a stage and platform and propped with a bunch of pillows at the bottom um, to carry the stage. But the role of the poet has not changed much. If anything, it has evolved. One of the things that I love to do in spoken word poetry is use it as a vehicle to reimagine and reclaim gods within the Hindu pantheon. And as a fourth generation, Indian person in Malaysia. Everything I know about Indian mythology and the Hindu pantheon is told to me by unreliable narrators, um, including my late grandmother and also Amaji Jagata. Yes. By the time these stories reach my generation, they are steeped in patriarchy and cemented into mantras. These stories are often told by victors and men. So the women in mythology and their perspectives are often missing or hidden or voiceless. And what I like to do in my poems is 
I've chosen to reimagine their perspective. What if they were there? And what if they had something to say? I have, um, in the past, I have, I have chosen to write about popular icons within the Indian mythology, such as Draupadi from Mahabharata, and also Kanigi, um, as told me by in Amachitrakata comics. But today I have chosen a less popular icon. Her name is Chaya Devi, and she is essential to the story. She is the mother of Lord Shani, um, who is also known as the god of karma. And in Indian astrology, it is believed that Shani, who is the embodiment of the planet, uh, planet Saturn, affects individuals and the world across selected years. And what he does is that he either dispenses misfortune or justice according to your karmic debt. This year, 2020, is Shani's year. Now, when I did my research about Shani and his family, I discovered that his, his father is the ever-present and absent sun god. His mother is a reluctant mother and she is made from the shadows of the wife that came before. Her name is Chaya Devi and in this poem I have for you today, I imagine Chaya in her early hours of motherhood as she battles an unending spiral of baby blues. While nursing her infant godson, Chaya is telling Shani why he cannot prevent what he will become. I worry that when you become a toddler, the house will represent everything that isn't who I am and what I stand for. Napkins occupying the wash line, toys of varying significance in forgotten nooks and the smell of baby permeates every surface. Everything I own will surrender to your existence. Corners of kitchen cabinets will be made blunt. Bathroom mats must be non-slip. I must prevent your dying to achieve my terminal role as a good mother. And when you feel like it, we will go to Tupperware parties and potlucks of mediocre kitchidi made by other women and their mothers who told us to bear children. And now when it is too late, when saliva leaks from your mouth, the aunties will gather and they will cackle at my motherhood and utter the words. I never said it would be easy. Nothing about you is easy, shiny boy. Half star, half shadow, middle child, never first or last, forever subsequent when attended to and hardly ever appeased. When you suckle on what is left of me, you will taste the remnants of your brother's spit, father's bite, and the dry husk of my form. You crave me and wail when I am milkless, bloodless, and dark. You empty me and I must let you to shield me from judging eyes. Kanna, I birthed you from the sins I have yet to commit. You take your first breath and the truth telling begins. I don't want you. On most days, on other days, I wish you were not mine. Forever you will be your mother's color and father's temper, always the result of our decisions and afterthought. I am here to tell you now, while you have no choice but to listen and will soon forget that all your faults are my own. The suffering inside you contains my suffering and you will grow into solidified adult agony that no one will understand not even your imperfect mother when you build a scream in the shape of my name inside your throat um, uh, i will pray for deafness 
when you drop the initial exhale of and cut my title into a murmur. I will abandon you, Shiva, and leave you to your own destruction. Any sound you use to replace my name will remain a disappointment. I love you ferociously, but I love me more. Our relationship is an unsettled score. You, I, I owe you life. You, you owe me a living, a debt. You will attempt to repay me by indebting all of humanity across selected years, be it a nail prick or slaughter, bomb blast, or diseased. You will tilt effect into cause. Astrologers will summit around your shrine and persuade you on Saturdays. And when 2020 arrives, the scales of your vengeance seesaws in its inequality, tipping into balance momentarily before spilling onto other people outside your mother. Mother observes the auditory notes of murder, doesn't it? I think they are each other's root word. I think about eating you. One time when I was bathing you, I imagined your drowning in the viscosity and airlessness of castor oil while you suffocate. I think about devouring you, the crunch and crack of your ribcage in my mouth as I eat the god out of your shadow and sever the flesh from your future. I only stopped because your father walked in into my tasks and snatched my duties away. You only reach my arms now when the planets deem it necessary under watchful mother-in-law eyes. My motherhood is crowded and yet your childhood is lonely. On the days we unite, my son, I will grant you all the light your father withheld. I will raise you to humble the spinal cords of your worshippers so that you may milk their karmic debt to fill the gaps of my loving you. I will love you more when you forgive me and when you can't, you will kick me and I will paralyze you out of discipline. Otherwise, what kind of mother do you think I am? That was absolutely beautiful. That was so powerful. And I can hear, I can hear the roar all the way from Boulder, Colorado, all our colleagues there, Jesse and Jules and Maruta sort of, you know, standing and applauding. Thank you, Melizirani to Salva. I wish, like I said, we could have done this in person, but hey, this is still fabulous. Next up is uh, Raymond Del. Castillo. Ramonda Castillo is the past chair of the Chicana Studies Department at the Metropolitan State University of Denver and past chair of the Master's Program of Nonprofit Management, m and at Regis University. Poetry is his passion with books that include uh, Kizales Are Not Extinct, Rhapsodic Rhythm and Blues, Tales from a Mikokano, Broken Concrete from the Corazon of a Batoloco, and when the owl can't see at night, many apologies for all the pronunciations I must have got wrong by now. Uh, Chile, Colorado, a CD with three local poets and a storyteller is used in the El Alma de la Raza curriculum, a culturally competent curriculum depicting the contributions of Latinos to the United States used in Denver public schools with a unit of Dr. Del Castillo's poetry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Raymond De Castillo. Well, good evening. I, I have to say that uh, I'm quite humbled to be with uh, such great poets. Um, I, was, I was mentored by a curandera. That's an indigenous healer in our culture. And she, she told me before she, we parted 
that I would spend my professional life with women and to always respect them. Well, I do that humbly always. My mother taught me that lesson a long time ago. I'm going to start because it's uh, Veterans Day. I'm a veteran. I really was lucky because I did not have to go to Vietnam at the time. My brother was there in the Marine Corps. So, and I, and I think my, 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 my path was to end up serving the Vietnam veterans because I worked in Iran, a community mental health center. And when um, I started working with veterans, I sat down and wrote this poem, wrote this poem called Los Soldados de la Gente. I write in a combination of English and Spanish, which equals Spanglish in a lot of the poetry. So I want to dedicate this today to veterans. Uh, I have fulfilled my role as a warrior from the times of ancient Aztec civilization to the halls of Montezuma and to the shores of Tripoli. My survival instincts and my pride and dignity marred by the insults of an unjust society carved on the sidewalks and the pathways of my barrios are now scribbled on headstones that lie in cold, damp cemeteries where we were once denied entrance. I fought along the side of those not so great heroes whose pictures fill great voids in our lives, hanging from mantelpieces in our living rooms, but who in reality desecrate the meaning of humanity. I was taken from my streets in the fighting against the war on poverty and racism to a place far and distant in a rice paddy. And I was told that it was okay to kill. And today, as I spend restless nights lying in the agony of my soul, I awaken to the reality, a forgotten warrior marked with labels unfit for human wearing. I struggle to forget those experiences that were once only fantasies and dreams, but that today exist as real life. The restoration and needs I have are filled by guilt-ridden government officials and inadequate GI monies covered by the blood of those people who we called our enemies. The second poem, uh, I think unconsciously poets, part of themselves comes out in what we write at some level. And actually my father was in the Marine Corps as well. And this poem actually won first place in the uh, Mile High Denver Society in 1989. And so I re remember watching my father and he must have been going through what today is called post-traumatic stress disorder, but we didn't know that. And I watched him kind of destroy himself. I knew him at a time when he was followed by the sweet scent of Old Spice. Y cuando su corbata estaba bien amarrada, his slick black shiny hair smelled like the pomade of the times. He carried his pool cue like old faithful, the two operated like a wild oil machine. I used to know him at a time when his walk was like a Marine Corps drill instructor. Keeping the rhythms of old tapes that only he knew. And now, the only scent that follows him is the smell of Las Crudas that have destroyed his fragile body. His corbata has been replaced by a raggedy t shirt that tells the story of a lonely vato whose hair is gray prematurely caused by the many pangs that he's carried most of his life. His old faithful has now become alien to his shaking hands. His walk is now slow pacing, whose rhythm is out of beat, and his spirit, it has died. Having, I've seen the best and the worst of the human condition. I ran a, I worked in the field of mental health and for 17 years, and actually wrote my doctoral dissertation in curanderismo with with the what with a case study of the woman that was my mentor as one of them, and when I left, I wrote this. There's a concept in our culture called the vato loco, which is the crazy dude. I think all cultures have them. They're street wise. They know a lot, but they don't always make good decisions. So I dedicated this to the vatos locos that I saw in the jails and the prisons and in community mental health. 
Pato Loco, con su cabeza llena de mota, lighting the, pit, the paths dark with fear. Can you hear? As you sit idly in the classrooms where the silence of indoctrination subtly grabs you and makes a believer of false notions of inferiority and then passes judgment about your ancestors' feathers. Orale! Pato Loco, your path, they tell you that it is predetermined, that it is filled with solemn images where you stand behind bars while your intestines filled with crack. Eat away at your conscience laying bare in the front streets the sus propios barrios filled with homeboys and pop-tarts and nightmares and gruesome realities caused by the ingestion of filthy needles shot into arms full of tattoos. Orale, vato loco. Take off that handkerchief, ese. Take off the handkerchief and wipe away the blood, the sangre of a thousand years of miseria cuando sus carnales estaban cantando sweet, sweet melodies into the ears of the beautiful rucas about dreams that have never come true. Orale, vato loco, escape from the fires of el infierno that fry you like a crispy critter so that you can become the avena for the breakfast of the champions of society who will eventually take everything that you are worth and treat it for sale as a commodity on the common market. Orale, vato loco, wake up. Anachronism, that is not your dessert. Pan dulce y chocolate. Doesn't that sound better? Wake up, vato loco, wake up. find this other poem somebody mentioned immigrants and uh before i leave this world you know i'm a social justice activist i'm going to continue to keep fighting for immigrants and it breaks my heart when i imagine these children locked in cages um and that that's just earth shattering to me so my wife was a teacher uh, i did some work with her kids and um, she came home one day and, and she was upset. I said, what's wrong? She goes, that little boy who well, I was teaching uh, statistics by you playing with money and coins and playing games. And this little kid walked out with a pocket full of money. Well, he was already a statistician and a mathematical mind. His mom died and nobody from the district went to his funeral. So I wrote this poem out of anger as poets do especially protest poetry. When an immigrant dies, no one cries. The statisticians, they simply report more lies. They add a fictitious name to a scroll about the unknown. Morticians build undecorated wooden caskets, but there's an emptiness in flower baskets when an immigrant dies. When an immigrant dies, those guarding the front gates continue these groundless debates. The border guards looking for for malicious rewards, they wear fake badges and with pistols and hands drawn from leather holsters, they protect inhumane demands. They can't hardly wait to put another notch on their pistol belts. And while the snow melts, <clears throat> they claim a victory. Pero sabes que el alma continues to remain a mystery when the immigrant dies. When an immigrant dies, the troops dressed in green and some in blue line up without a clue and with plastic gadgets ceremonial minute men line up at attention and sal salute old glory but they never hear the story of women sweating in fields for worn out dollar bills they have never seen a severed umbilical cord from a member of this thing they call the brown ward their only concern <clears throat> is to fatten pocketbooks paid by taxpayers dollars covered by sangre molida que ahorita está bien podrida. But guess what? Nobody hollers during another stormy raid when the dust finally settles. Ice, melted by the sweltering heat of oppression, falls upon the statistician looking for the regression while las familias solemnly march to el panteón for termination. Rituals followed by historical rites are created as ceremonies to honor the dead. When an immigrant dies, a woman behind, hides behind a black shawl 
she secretly sneaks into the church hall. The worms start to crawl and a baby lets out a loud bawl. A father holds his children in paralyzing fear. As tears fall from the skies, grief is suppressed. A corrido is created for posterity and paleteros tip their hats in respect. Melancholy spreads like fire. Pero sabes que nobody really cares when an immigrant dies. When an immigrant dies, the hot dry winds wail like the melodious cries of La Llorona. She moans and groans the loss of her children. She scolds her sister, the Statue of Liberty, an image of America, the beautiful ready to fall and crumble from the power of strong xenophobic winds. While ballads are created about deportees, she weeps in hot deserts filled to the brim with chip bones and calaveras, sands moistened by tears drying in the sun as coffins are laid into the womb of Mother Earth without mirth, while bodies turn to skeletons ready to rest for the last ceremony, and only despair fills the air when an immigrant dies. When an immigrant dies, an espiritu flees back to La Frontera and climbs that monstrous wall, seeking solace as the morning dew waits for a clarion call, while the immigrants stand in line for the last reveille, and the bugler plays the horn saying adios to a mother of the corn while innocent children mourn, watching Tierra cast upon an empty casket as it is Espiritu del Inmigrante finally escapes and soars into the heavens like a kite with the long tail. But nobody will ever know and nobody really cares when an immigrant dies. Ramon, thank you so much. That was a beautiful way to end when an immigrant dies. We're seeing the situation across the world, not just in the United States. Uh, the hatred of the other is a real problem. And we do hope literature and poetry, these are things that can push back on the hatred and the fear of the other and learn to treat people uh, as equals with empathy and with love. Thank you all, each one of you. These were just such beautiful sharings and we're delighted that we had this session to end the first round of JLF uh, Colorado and Boulder 2020. Uh, many thanks, uh, Natalie Handel, Janice Pariat, Melizirani Di Selva and Ramon Del Castillo for this amazing session. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience uh, day after day. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers that are available through the Boulder Bookstore in the United States and Full Circle in India. Uh, do follow our handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to be notified for the next round of sessions. These are jlflitfest.org backslash Colorado for the full schedule and information about our speakers. Please do remember that in these unusually difficult times, you really struggle to bring you JLF Colorado without charging any registration fee. Please do donate as generously as you can to JLF Colorado to ensure a free, seamless, and continuous flow of knowledge and information. Once again, we'd like to thank all our official partners uh, for supporting us. We hope you all enjoyed these conversations and we'll log back next week from 15th to the 18th of November for JLF Colorado at 6.15 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 8.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 5.15 p.m. Pacific Time, and 6.45 a.m. Indian Standard Time the next day. This is followed by JLF Houston, 21st, 22nd, JLF New York, 23rd, 24th, and JLF Toronto, 27th to the 29th of November. Take care, stay masked, stay safe. Uh, these are difficult times and look forward to seeing you all back next week.
Jaipur Literature Festival a living library or perhaps even a library of life. Do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science, of the joys of poetry and music, the consolations of philosophy, the sense of literature and of life. about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics. It's meaningful. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that People at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. Work Arts, bringing India to the world, the world to India, Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Teamwork Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, have taken the flavour of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars, be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalaotsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. 
The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavor by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities, featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer singer Jameson Ross, and Dave Weckel, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the multi-city Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information visit www.teamworkarts.com I think everywhere I've ever lived, I always looked for the library. They come to the library because they want to be with people. Corporations are not people in the library. People are people, right? And so being able to come in and participate and learn and control that learning experience is, is what, we, what we offer to the community. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, it can develop into something amazing. We want them to recognize that they have the agency and the potential to create change and have a voice. To become what they hope to be, to empower them to realize their aspirations. No matter who they are, no matter what age they are, no matter what their background or ability is. We're going to learn together, right? And you know what? Not just me, because I want to create together, but I think we want to create together. Give us your knowledge. Give us what you do best. Give us your culture, give us good feedback, give us bad feedback, give us any feedback. Um, let us grow with you. Just come and ask to. Ask a librarian, we're all here waiting to help you. To work together, to collaborate, and to come up with a larger, louder voice as a collective. We are bolder together. We are bold, hey wait. Somos bolder juntos. <laughs> we are bolder. 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 Together. 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 <laughs> We're bolder together. We're bolder together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kahani Online where you discover the magic of storytelling in all its forms. Very special guest with a very special story. Please welcome actor and author Soha Ali Khan. The story that I've chosen is called Someday. Here it is. And it's by Alison McGee and Peter H. Reynolds. It's a story that I've read many times to Inaya. Everyone grab a pencil, eraser and a notebook. 
as we are about to learn how to write short stories. That's very simple. All you have to remember is five points. Grumpy, we have a special story for you that dates back to the year 1962. Major Shaitan Singh Bhatti and his soldiers. Chief ne Bharat par hamla bola tha. Ye ladai pura ek mahina chali thi. Our storyteller today is Katrina Zayel, all the way from Lithuania in in um in Europe. Yes, in Europe. And she's going to tell us about some strange and fascinating mythological creatures. Today I will introduce you all to Lithuanian mythology. I will show you our modern world full of hidden myth mythical creatures. I will narrate to you an episode of from one of our oldest epics, the Ramayana. We'll be waiting to hear from you. Until next time, bye-bye! <laughs>